All right. First off, to all of our guests, welcome. Um, I'm Brian Conlon. I'm in charge of business development here with Meridian Pacific Properties. and want to thank you all for being with us today for our uh, semi-annual Memphis update. Uh, our commitment really is to provide updates and education for all of our investors to keep you all apprised as to what we know and what we're learning. Um, in essence, we want you guys to know what we know so that you can un understand what it is that we're trying to do and accomplish um, as we're always committed to providing the best products and services for everyone here. So today's meeting, we're gonna be covering really three topics. One is a general overview of the single family residential investment market, specifically build to rent. Secondly, we're gonna be talking about the Memphis submarket in particular. And then third, we're gonna be talking about future opportunities for all of, all of, uh, all of the investors out there. So uh, who I have joining us on the panel today, let me make sure I get this going, is uh, Kevin Conlon, the co-founder and principal of Meridian Pacific Properties is gonna be providing the Build to Rent Market Overview. Um, Ken Koikendall, our president, will be providing the overview of Memphis. I will be taking us through future investment opportunities. And then our client relationship manager, Jordan Barvel, will be wrapping us up here with the Q&A. So before we officially jump in, a couple housekeeping items to share with you guys. So as we share and discuss what's going on um, in Memphis, you guys may have questions that arise. At any point at the bottom of Zoom, you should see a Q&A button. And if you press the Q&A button, it gives you the opportunity to write in a question. Jordan will be monitoring the Q&A box throughout the meeting. So if you have any questions that you want us to answer, please go ahead and type it in there. And we'll make sure to either address it in the moment or at the very least, we'll address it at the very end when we wrap up the webinar. The webinar is expected to be about 45 minutes and I think that covers it. Panelists, anything else you want to put in or say before we jump in? <clears throat> All right, without further ado, turn it over to you, Dad, for a build to rent market investment overall. All right, thank you, Brian, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's July 1st. It's hard to believe we're already in the uh, second half of the year. Uh, turns out there are 177 days uh, left to shop before Christmas, so we, we still have plenty of time. Uh, in any case, this morning, I'm going to give you a um, uh, build to rent market investment outlook. And really, I'm going to be covering three topics, you know, kind, kind of where where we've been over the last year, uh, uh, where we are at uh, presently, and kind of what I see the prognosis as being, you know, what the outlook is uh, for the future. Okay, so let's uh, let's kind of re review what's happened over the last year. You know, you know the big story, of course, was COVID. Uh, one of the uh, unexpected consequences of COVID was that uh, it it turbocharged real estate demand, uh, and and it did this uh, really in three big ways. Uh, you know, first off, uh, COVID stimulated a phenomenon known as suburban migration. Uh, when COVID hit, if you found yourself living in an urban environment uh, where social distancing really wasn't possible, uh, you know, restaurants were closed, you know, museums were closed, everything was closed, and you were living in a small place with no yard, uh, it, it became very attractive to you to get out of your urban environment and into a less dense environment where you had a yard and more uh, more housing space, more privacy, a place for the kids, place for the dogs, and also a place to, 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 to feel a little more normal <laughs> than you did in, in your urban environment. So this stimulated a lot of demand for people moving out of urban areas into the suburbs. Second thing we saw was this uh, work from home phenomenon. Prior to COVID, uh, companies were very reticent to uh, allow their employees to work from home. Uh, they, you know, many companies figured that they, you know, employees couldn't be trusted to work uh, without, uh, without supervision. But in the case of uh, COVID, well, there was no choice. If you wanted your employees to work, the only option you had was to allow them to work from home. So that, that kind of forced the issue and uh, companies had to figure out how, how to adapt. From the employee's point of view, uh, it was actually kind of attractive because they didn't, 
you know, if they could work from home, they didn't have to commute. Uh, and they could also live where they wanted to. They, they didn't have to be near the urban office. They could, they could be in the suburbs. And in fact, in some cases, they could even be in other states. So, uh, uh, you know, COVID kind of forced the issue, but it, it worked. Uh, you know, companies figured out how to make it work. The employees were happier. And uh, again, that further increased demand for living in the suburbs. Uh, and the third thing that uh, COVID caused was, uh, you, know, you know, the economy tanked immediately, you know, the hospitality industry shut down and so forth. And we saw a lot of uh, stimulus programs. And one of the, uh, one of the stimulus programs was uh, the Fed, you know, significantly lowered interest rates. Uh, that had the effect of lowering mortgage rates, which had the effect of making housing more affordable. So uh, a lot of people really wanted to move and, uh, and, and it was affordable because interest rates were low. So on the supply side, we saw a big constraint in supply of homes. So there was very little relocation that occurred during COVID. If you were living in a, a, a good living situation where you were you know, not in a, you know, a, a dense urban situation or something, you just didn't want to leave your home, and therefore nobody listed their homes. And in fact, uh, COVID made made it difficult to show homes, even if you did want to sell. Uh, another th another thing that uh, really isn't related to COVID is uh, new construction has been undersupplied for ten years, and even before COVID hit, uh, builders were scrambling to. Uh, to, to catch up on the new homes that weren't built during the Great Recession. Uh, and and that is, that's a very significant factor. Third thing we saw was uh, supply chain disruptions uh, impacting supply of homes, uh, notably high lumber prices. Uh, if you're a builder, you know that uh, lumber is one of the biggest components of the total cost of a home. And lumber prices for builders like us quadrupled. They actually quadrupled during, uh, you know, during the COVID period up through uh, up through May. And if and if you're a builder and you're seeing one of your most expensive uh, cost components quadruple, it gives you pause. It makes you wonder. Well, gosh, should we wait until lumber prices settle down? Because certainly this isn't sustainable. But so a lot of builders uh, slowed down their, their building and that further constrained supply of homes. And a fourth factor is just, just lack of well-located de well developed land. Uh, you know, not only were homes undersupplied, but uh, developed land was undersupplied for a long time. And uh, a lot of developers went out of business during the Great Recession. And uh, as we emerge from the Great Recession, it's taken a while for developers to get back online. So what we saw uh, over the last year is this, this phenomenon of you know, extraordinarily high demand you know, for COVID-related reasons, uh, coupled with uh, uh, low supply of homes. And of course, that's what resulted in this uh, extraordinarily high appreciation that we saw, you know, really in nearly all of the markets around the country. So currently, where, where are we at? Well, interest rates are, you know, you know they, they've risen a little bit, but uh, they are still relatively low and stable. Uh, the Fed in their meeting in June said that they uh, intend to begin raising the federal funds rate in 2023. But gosh, that that's more than a year and a half out from right now. So 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 this is uh, <coughs> this is good news for people in real estate. Uh, the economy right now is pretty strong. We're seeing unemployment uh, continue to fall, and we're 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 beginning the journey to return to normal. So a lot of the COVID-related restrictions, uh, you know, have been lifted. We're seeing the hospitality industry, uh, you know, starting to crank back up. Uh, the travel industry is cranking back up again. Uh, and, you know, as this continues, 
uh, this will result in lower uh, unemployment, which is you know, always good for real estate. Uh, the phenomenon of, phenomena of suburban migration and work from home that I just spoke of uh, you know, on, the, on the previous slide, those are here to stay. I mean, COVID may have stimulated them to occur in the first place, but uh, people have an appetite for living in the suburbs. They, they like their space. Uh, if they have the ability to work from home, maybe a couple days a week, uh, you know, living in the suburbs is very attractive. So suburban areas and rural areas have, have done uh, phenomenally well, but uh, I, I don't think we're gonna unring the bell on this one. Uh, we'll, we'll see people returning to, you know, offices and, um, but it won't necessarily be for five days. It may be for one day or three days or, or, or whatnot. Another thing we're observing is uh, appreciation. You know, this high level of appreciation is beginning to cause problems with affordability in certain markets, uh, per particularly in the uh, you know, so-called expensive markets like California, you know, the West Coast in general, New York. Uh, you know, ho homes are just simply being priced out of reach because people don't have the incomes to, to support, you know, support buying homes at these higher prices. Uh, but in other regions that are more affordable, you, you know, where you're spending less of your income on housing, you know, like Memphis, we're not seeing this so much yet. Eventually, we probably will, but uh, right now, uh, there's still a lot of runway in the more affordable markets. So bottom line is, right now, uh, what we're seeing is strong appreciation continuing. I mean, we had strong appreciation over the last year, uh, but rolling into 2021, it's, it's gone on unabated even as we speak here on July 1st. Built to Rent uh, continues to be the star of the uh, investment real estate world. It, you know, it continues to outperform the other predominant uh, real estate asset classes, including retail, hospitality, office, and multifamily. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, uh, of all of the new homes built, only about 6% uh, of the new homes are uh, purpose built for rent and, and the rest are being sold to retail home buyers. But that 6% is expected to double by 2024. Uh, you know, many single family uh, renters are people who are deliberately choosing to rent because they desire the freedom and flexibility that rent, uh, renting affords them. Uh, if they have a family situation that has some uncertainty or a job situation that has some uncertainty or uh, the, the geographic place where, where they are choosing to live, you, you know, they're not sure if they want to stay there or not, they deliberately choose to rent. And, and uh, this is part of what is, is fueling this uh, big growth in the build to rent uh, segment. So looking ahead, you know, the question, you know, on most people's minds is, uh, well, gee, you know, we had this great run up in, uh, you know, home values. It was a great time to, to, to have owned real estate, but am, am I late to the party? Is, is, is there still, still some meat on that bone? You know, is single family real estate still a good investment? And based on everything that I have seen, uh, it definitely continues to be a good investment. You know, you know, largely because the factors that have been driving this high level of appreciation are still present with us uh, right now and will be for the foreseeable future. Um, Lawrence Yun, who's the chief economist of the National Association of Realtors, as recently as yesterday said, uh, strong, stronger than normal appreciation is likely to continue in the coming months and probably won't slow until late 2021 or early 2022. Okay, and he cites the very things that I just finished talking about, you know, lack of home supply, surging demand, and low interest rates. So, so that there's no mystery as to what's, uh, what's going on here, but it, it, it is sustainable for the foreseeable future. 
Now, a question, you know, we often get asked, and certainly one that I ponder a lot is, uh, gosh, if we gotten ahead of ourselves, is there a bubble right now? Is this, is this thing going to pop kind of like it did during the Great Recession? So I've read a lot of opinions on this, you know, a lot of economists uh, and, uh, you know, institutions have weighed in on this. And, and the general consensus seems to be that this is not a bubble that we are seeing right now. If you look at what's driving demand, uh, you know, the things that are causing it are, are, are very, very, very fundamental and not artificially induced in any way. It's, it's, it's a very natural outgrowth of what COVID caused. <coughs> and uh, people, uh, you know, want to move to the suburbs and get into a good, uh, uh, you know, work at home situation. Uh, if you look back at the Great Recession and what, what caused that, that, that was the subprime mortgage crisis. That was uh, the lending industry being allowed to make loans to people who had no business getting loans. Uh, you, you know, lending standards were very loose. Uh, it, it fueled a lot of speculation. Uh, and you know, consequently, we saw this big run up in prices, which uh, what, you know, was, was not sustainable and the bubble burst. But that's not what we're seeing uh, in, in, in this upturn right now. Another thing we're seeing is continued strong interest in the build to rent space from Wall Street funds. There's an awful lot of institutional money flowing into the space right now. And uh, you know, you've got to figure if uh, Wall Street, who studies this, you know, the, these investments pretty carefully, you know, it, it, if they like them, uh, it's certainly something we all should consider. So I feel pretty bullish right now, at least uh, you know for the foreseeable future. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Hey, thank you, Dad. That was that was terrific. And now, to move on to the the Memphis submarket update, let's go to our president, Ken Kuykendall. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, yeah, Kevin has given you a great um, kind of global national look at the status of things. Let's take a little deeper look into Memphis. And you know, I'm going to start with some anecdotal uh, information uh, that's been in the news recently. Uh, just talking about the Memphis economy, what is supporting it, and why it continues to thrive. And everything flows out of that economy. Uh, FedEx just last week announced they're going to be spending another $7.2 billion to increase their capacity, uh, a billion of which will be in the Tennessee, uh, in the Tennessee area, mostly in the Memphis area. So they are, they are uh, driving the capacity of the distribution economy there. And the natural outcropping of that is distribution centers keep going up at a record pace. And Brian's gonna be showing you a map in a minute, but with the completion of the outer freeway ring uh, around the uh, outer limits of the metropolitan area, now those distribution centers are able uh, because they're connected to the, to the airport much easier in, in the rail yards. Uh, those distribution centers are going more around the perimeter of Memphis, and that's where the jobs are, and that's where the, the homes are going to be. But anecdotally, you know, we use a lot of concrete in our, in our construction, and the concrete demand has gone through the roof because of all these distribution centers. And, you know, they used to run their mills in the Memphis, and concrete's a local commodity because it has to be mixed. Uh, and transported wet before it sets. So it's, it's a local commodity. And those um, concrete mills have had to switch from working six days a week, one shift, to working five days a week, two shifts, uh, to meet the demand. So we're in competition with uh, these million square foot distribution centers that you, know, you hear of uh, one or two getting completed every quarter. Uh, so the growth continues, and that clearly you know, leads into jobs. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Brian. And all this is kind of the, you know, we talk about COVID uh, and the e-commerce economy in Memphis. You know, when you put a distribution center in Memphis, that means your goods and your goods are one trip away from your customer rather than two. And that's why everybody is moving their distribution centers to Memphis. You save money on shipping and time. You can get an order in by 11 p.m. at night. It makes 
makes it to the hospital that it needs to get to the next day or the customer needs to get to the next day. And this economic model for Memphis has been validated and, and frankly advanced during COVID. You know, we were already in an in a, um, e-commerce environment and COVID just step function that up uh, to the next level because all of a sudden people were trapped at home, obviously, and, and did a lot more shopping online. And that is not going to abate uh, anytime soon, uh, which is why FedEx uh, is making all these investments and why the uh, companies are building their distribution centers. So we continue to see that growth. Um, and just recently, Tennessee and Mississippi, uh, they, they announced a couple of months ago that they would be one of the first states to eliminate the $300 supplemental federal unemployment benefits. So their unemployment rate stands at about 6% uh, in May. That's projected to come down to 4% uh, by August once those benefits go away. So this economy is, is really starting to heat up. Now, you probably all saw in the news last week where the states that have initiated or cut off this extra uh, unemployment benefit from the feds, their economies are growing uh, much faster than the other economies that haven't done that. So Tennessee and Memphis are uh, right in the sweet spot trying to make that happen. And so we expect, you know, by all the reports that employment's going to grow about 3% um, next year and continue to grow along those lines, about 10 to 15 uh, new jobs a year. And right now there's about 4,000, 4,500 building starts projected for this year. Uh, still a bit of a shortfall from what the need is. And, and, you know, Kevin was pointing out that there's, a, there's just a 15 year trend of not building enough homes to meet the demand. Memphis will catch up at some point, uh, but we still aren't there, which is, as he talked about, nationally is driving demand and that is happening in, in prices and that's happening in Memphis as well. And particularly in Memphis, we're definitely seeing um, a flight to the suburbs for health reasons, security reasons, more space reasons, and proximity to the jobs. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why the population is moving to the outer, the outer banks of, uh, or perimeter of, of Memphis. Right. So let's talk about uh, in property management, you know, how has the COVID environment affected the management of your properties? Um, you probably saw the news this week or last week that the CDC extended the moratorium on evictions. Well, good news is Mississippi and Tennessee have not been subject uh, to that moratorium for the last four to five months. Uh, the courts in, in Tennessee and Mississippi um, challenged that and, uh, and they are not, they're no longer subject to it. So we had about five evictions kind of stored up through COVID and we were able to process all five of those in the last four months. So the courts are in session and this is just one more example of how investing in this part of the country, uh, rules of law apply and contracts are honored and it applies to the landlord uh, tenant uh, environment as well. So we're very pleased to see that. Rent collections uh, stayed strong all through COVID and that's continued through the first half of 2021, 99.6% so far this year, year to date. Uh, and we really don't see any adverse news or, or adverse events on the horizon to, to change that. In terms of vacancy, you know, we see from uh, John Burns reports that uh, most of Memphis B and C class properties are running uh, vacancy rates above 10%. Of course, we're only in A class properties um, and ours is running at 4% or below and that has continued. You know, and this, this is a function of the type of properties we, um, we build and market and the underwriting criteria uh, of, our, of our residents so that we keep those properties um, tenanted with the right types of tenants. Um, in terms of turn costs, you know, this, this is an area that we all hate it when we, eventually you're going to have uh, an expensive turn. I mean, that is going to happen, particularly after long tenancies. And, and yet, on average, uh, we've been able to take steps in the last two years, particularly in the last year, to really lower our average uh, turn cost per house. You know, with uh, working with uh, more newer properties through our construction business, uh, better treatments, more durable treatments, and increased inspections. We have a whole uh, much enhanced uh, inspection protocol for our property managers so that we're doing a little bit of preventive maintenance along the way, a little bit more preventive maintenance along the way. 
So we've been able to get the average turn cost net of the deposit that gets from the tenant that gets applied uh, from 2,500 uh, two years ago in 2019 to this year to date, it's about 1,600. So that will bounce around a little bit. Like you said, turn costs do tend to go up the longer the tenancy. Uh, but in general, this is an apples to apples comparison and uh, it's, it's trending in the right direction. Okay. In terms of leasing, uh, this is an area where <laughs> we have seen exceedingly strong demand uh, for a lot of reasons and that, that Kevin was alluding to. And, and, and on top of that, you've got some fairly desperate people uh, in the market looking for a place to live. And we have had our applications go up 500% uh, versus two years ago in 2019. They, once, once we got through the initial phases of COVID, uh, by July, August last year, we started to, started to see a spike in that. So our uh, leasing team is having to uh, sift through a lot more applications uh, to, uh, to find the right tenants that we need for our properties. But our strong underwriting criteria uh, continues and we, are, we have been able to uh, uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to get tenants in the properties because of that increased demand. Uh, and we don't see that abating. You know, last year we thought it would go down during the holidays. It didn't go down at all. You know, but people were are desperate for, for, for a place to live. Rent growth, you know, we have traditionally in our leases, we've capped the renewal rate increase at 4%. Given the, the state of the market, uh, we're going to lift that cap and it's going to get up around 5 or 6%. But right now this year, we're seeing about a 4% increase on renewals. But new leases, uh, those are going at 6 8%. And in some neighborhoods, 10% uh, where, where the situation warrants it. So that's the good news. Rents don't rise as quickly as home prices, but they do eventually catch up. So that the ratios, the historical ratios come back as we go. In terms of price appreciation, um, yeah, Memphis had a fantastic last 12 months. We just looked at the newest report from the National Association of Realtors. That percentage always differs by which time period you look at. Uh, but Memphis year over year is up about 20% or about 25%, 33% more than the, uh, uh, the national average. That's great. But the best, it, what was driving that is, uh, you know, the, the rising demand, limited supply and the increased lumber prices. In fact, there was a question on the board here about, uh, you know, how have lumber prices affected the cost of the house? Uh, you know, nationally, they just throw out a number that they got is about $35,000 additional cost of the house. Uh, that goes up and down uh, based on what type of house it is. But for the most part, price increases were able to cover that up until about three months ago. And then there was this additional massive spike that just bit in the margins, uh, quite frankly, for, for, for about a month or two. But now those have dropped. The average uh, uh, lumber futures for thousand board feet has dropped from the peak of $1,600 per thousand board feet down to below $800 just in the last uh, eight weeks. So it's getting back to reality, which is good for everybody. Um, it will allow us to continue to provide um, solid investment product. But what's really nice about Memphis, if you go to the next slide, is that not only has it had great appreciation, it remains one of the most affordable markets uh, in the country. And this is uh, a Kiplinger's um, uh, list. This data actually comes from John Burns, but it ranks all, mar all metro areas by affordability, one through 10, one being the most affordable. And Memphis continues to be in that top quartile. Um, so even though prices are up 20%, uh, we are still in a very affordable market. And that's, that's kind of the Goldilocks zone where you can get high appreciation and high affordability which is going to make, uh, make for great investments in real estate. Um, so we, Memphis has been steady, steady, steady over the last 10 years. And that's why Kevin and Jeff selected Memphis uh, a long time ago as an economy that, uh, uh, that we believe in and will, con and will continue to provide this type of value. Uh, and last slide, you know, we just want to talk real quickly about um, the transition that Meridian has made in the last two years. Uh, we were fairly, two years ago, we were very dependent upon buying lots from other developers. And as the supply of buildable lots started to decline, uh, we had to make a pivot, a pivot decision.
that we had to become our own supplier of lots. And so we did create a joint venture uh, two years ago to start developing raw land uh, into full-blown full neighborhoods. And we are just starting to build in the first of those neighborhoods that have come online through that joint venture. We've got about 12 of them uh, on the board for the next uh, under development for the next four or five years. So what you see here is an escalation in the number of homes that we are going to be um, selling, building and selling. And the blue bar is the investor homes and the pink bar is the retail homes. And what we're finding in Memphis is it's not a market that's quite ready for these massive build to 100% build to rent neighborhoods. There's a lot of political issues, a lot of local issues. So we have to combine retail homes sold to homeowners with investor homes in these neighborhoods uh, to get them developed. So we are also having to become um, uh, a seller of retail homes, which we think actually creates a nice mix in all of our neighborhoods. And it still allows us to control the HOA, the CCNRs as we develop these neighborhoods. So we have a lot more control over the quality of the product and the, and the ongoing quality of the neighborhoods that we're building in. So we're very excited about this growth and think this growth is gonna propel uh, a lot of opportunity for our investors over the next four or five years. And Brian is actually gonna get in and talk to some of those specifically right now. Absolutely, thank you, Ken. And uh, <clears throat> before I continue, I know that there's a couple of questions that have not yet been answered. We'll make sure to get to those at the end of the presentation once I get through the investor opportunity. So. As Ken just alluded to, uh, we're pretty excited about Memphis and the potential based on the affordability and the strength of the local economy. So by us really going all in on Memphis and having more control over lots and being able to develop, we've been able to really handpick and select the areas in which we want to build and construct these homes. So what I'll be talking to you about today is ultimately that. What are the new opportunities that are going to be here for investors? What can you as an investor look forward to in 2021, for the remainder of the year and beyond? And uh, we've kind of had a shortage of supply in the past couple of months for it that that's kind of shoulder season, if you will, between uh, when we were developing homes or developing lots that are gonna have the homes completed. So it's really end of third quarter, start of fourth that we're gonna be uh, building homes um, with, great, with great speed and velocity. So as far as where we're doing this, Kent also mentioned earlier, if you look in this map here in the center, you can see a, a 40 to 40 ring. For many years when we first started, we hung out around that 4240 ring, kind of just on the outskirts in those subdivisions. Well, as Memphis has grown in this freeway of uh, 269, which connects down here into 69, it's actually expanded the suburban environment. And the, the area between the 240 loop and the 269 loop has become uh, ground zero for the logistics world. So a lot of what we have been targeting are the neighborhoods and you know class A communities that exists right along the, that freeway. So the ones that are listed or shown here in color represent the ones that we're gonna be talking about today that are gonna be available between now and the end of the year. The transparent ones in Millington, Oakland, Somerville, and so on and so forth are ones that we have coming online in 2022 and beyond. All right, so first off, we're gonna be talking about the Creekwood subdivision in Bahalia, Mississippi, which is down here. So. Uh, the rundown is this, we're building 32 homes in a subdivision that already has existed. Um, we're going to be doing a half retail and half investor mix because that's really what the market demands. The thing to know about Bahalia is that it is an up and coming market. There are lots of jobs that have gone there. And in fact, Amazon's newest fulfillment center was just put there, but really they have no homes to supply the demand of jobs. So we've actually spoken with city officials. They've been wanting us to get in there and build. And so uh, not just with Creekwood, but we have two other subdivisions in which we're gonna be building on over the next several years. As far as what this subdivision looks like, uh, you know, these are really homes that are 2,000 to 2,200 square feet, kind of our typical hardened buy box, four to five bedrooms, two and a half, three baths. Prices starting around 280, and you can see a nice plat map here um, with the first and second phase of where all the homes are gonna go in the sub. All right, second subdivision here is Chateau Ridge, which is in one of our favorite cities of Olive Branch, Mississippi. There's nine homes in this particular subdivision. We're actually building out a cul-de-sac within an existing subdivision. Uh, we're gonna be having the first ones come to market in probably late September, early October, and we're gonna be building out the rest of them probably no later than uh, the end of the year. 
So what we like about Olive Branch, centrally located in a fantastic school system. To get a look at what the homes are gonna be like, they're really about 2000 square foot, four bedroom, two and a half bath, 273K, and you can see kind of the layout here of the cul-de-sac. All right, the next one is gonna be Rasco Farms, which is located in South Haven, Mississippi. Uh, these ones are good schools and also right in the middle of the logistics center. It's just a few miles down, the, or a couple miles down the road from the Memphis International Airport, which is right here. So there's 13 homes in this particular uh, build. This is actually the final phase in a new construction subdivision. So you can see here that all these other homes, they, or all these other lots have been built out. We're really building these final 13 with plans that are gonna be very similar. Well, this is one of the plans, but all the plans are gonna be this rear load two-story design, which really means that people just have the garage in the back of the house and they get access to it in this 20 foot public alley. But homes here are a little bit smaller and the price is a little more economical at 240K. All right, the fourth one we're gonna be talking about today is Mallard Park. Now, this is one that, that we're pretty excited about because Walls is an area that has just been, it's had terrific school systems for years, but there is literally no housing available out there until recently. There's a couple other subdivisions being built out. Um, this one is, uh, you know, it's about a 10 minute drive to the Horn Lake Shopping Centers. It's a little bit more semi-rural, but with the school systems and the demand picking up so strongly, um, we're really excited about the possibility here. This particular subdivision is neat in the sense that um, there's a walk, you know, there's a pond down here, a walking, uh, a walking trail, picnic area, so on and so forth. We're doing about a 75%, 25% mix of uh, investor versus retail. And these homes are all about 2000 to 2200 square feet and are coming in, are starting at around 255K. So I know we have a waiting list currently, but um, if you're on the list and we'll be talking to me at some point this year for homes coming out in the second half of this year, these are gonna be the four areas in which we will be discussing the opportunities. Now, as far as been what's going on in the market, and this is a national phenomenon, there's, uh, we were talking earlier about how home prices have gone up at a quicker clip than rents. So the impact of that is actually what's known as cap rate compression. So cap rate or capitalization rate is that quick and dirty metric we use to determine how efficient a home is at giving off cash flow. So it's really your net operating income, which is all of your rents received minus your expenses divided by the purchase price of the home. So the first year cap rate historically has been between five and a half and 6%. Well, across the country, based on this appreciation phenomenon, those cap rates have been dropped by about 50 basis points. So now we're looking at cap rates five to five and a half percent. At first blush, that seems like disappointing news, but what's been buoying returns in the midst of this um, situation is that low interest rates coupled with this high appreciation have actually been driving up your uh, overall internal rates of return. And for any leveraged buyer out there, it's actually been boosting their cash or cash on cash return as well. So unfortunately this doesn't um, support the cash buyers as much as the leveraged buyers. But right now in this low, mar or low interest rate market, um, if you're ever thinking about financing, now is certainly a good time. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, uh, you, you know, about the uh, low cap rates is that it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have low cash flow. Uh, and there are two reasons behind that. One, one is uh, interest rates are still pretty low right now. And consequently, that, uh, that helps overall cash flow for your uh, leverage buyers. Um, but the, well, let's see, I'll, 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 I'll get back to my thought here, uh, uh, you know, in a minute, I'll let Brian continue. Perfect. Thank you. So in talking about interest rates, let's, this graph shows for primary home mortgage rates, um, about six months ago, we were at an all-time low around 2.65%. As you can see, we're a little bit higher than that now. But historically, when I first started with Meridian, we were hovering around four and a half um, to almost 5%. And so us hanging out in the low threes is still a phenomenal rate for these types of loan products. However, there has been one rule that's come down the pike recently here by Fannie and Freddie, which is um, 
capping the second and investment home mortgage limit at 7% of total loans that a bank writes. So said another way, if a bank is issuing out um, home mortgages, 93% of those mortgages need to be for a primary residence. We've never had a cap like this before. And so there's uncertainty as to how this is going to impact um, the various banks. Certainly those that do more secondary and investment homes are gonna be hit with higher fees and rates to make it make sense for them to have, uh, you know, to use some of that 7% loan product um, on certain investors. So while that's still working itself out and the, the impact of that is still unknown, there's been an opportunity created in the market. And that is for something that is known as non-QM or non-qualified mortgages. So this is a loan that's very similar to a commercial product. This is not a conventional loan, therefore is not limited by the, the 10 conventional loan limit instituted by Fannie and Freddie Mac. So a number of investors have you know, 10 conventional loans and then they're kind of stuck. Well, if you have 10 loans, you have the option to still purchase one of these non-QM loan coupons. So you can get a 30 year fixed rate coupon for about three and a half percent right now with this one company, Finance of America. The closing costs are a little bit higher, but uh, historically these rates have been about five and a half to six and a half percent. So the fact that we're seeing three and a half percent is quite incredible. And so this benefit is now offsetting the potential threat that that 7% loan limit has created. The other benefit to these non-QM loans is you can actually take title inside of an LLC. So some people prefer that level of protection for their investment properties, but Fannie and Freddie will not provide loans to LLCs or businesses. So the other benefit to this loan product is you can get that additional LLC protection while also getting the benefit of a loan. All right, <clears throat> last thing I'll talk about, if I'm sure a number of you have seen this already, is we've been rolling out the portfolio performance reports. And what this does is it basically gives you an overview as to how your property has performed. Um, even if you haven't had one done in the past year, I would recommend getting another one done simply because with the appreciation that you've had, uh, it's a great time to see what your compound annual growth rate is, or which is a close proxy for internal rate of return in addition to your cap rate and your before tax cash flow. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to me or really anyone on this call and we can get you set up for an appointment. And with that being said, um, I'll turn it over to Jordan to uh, answer, read off any of the unanswered questions so far on the uh, Q&A portion. Alrighty, thanks, Brian. So it looks like we have a total of three questions. So first one from Tim Watchers. How has the price increase of wood affected the price of new home construction? Yeah, and that one Kent did speak to. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, sorry. yeah, no, I spoke to that earlier, but I'll answer it again uh, specifically is, yeah, we've been able to absorb that, you know, in, on average, it's been about $35,000 extra in the cost of a house. And we've been able to absorb that because the market price has gone up. But to be honest, they got so high uh, in the, uh, second quarter of this year that our margins just got pretty, pretty compressed. That's now coming back. So we're back in the realm of, of uh, profitability as a lot of homeowners are. Um, but, you know, we're seeing that because prices got so high, a lot of builders went on the sidelines, a lot of do-it-yourselfers went to the sidelines, just waiting for lumber prices to come back down. At the same time, supply is ramping up on the lumber side and some of the tariffs are coming down again. Uh, which is all of these things. We, we knew this would play itself out. We just don't know where it's going to land and stabilize. Thanks, Ken. Great. And uh, Jordan, can you read the second one? Yes. So second question from Sean Okamura. What is driving the doubling projection for built-to-rent homes from 6% to 12%, i.e., why do you expect that growth? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> One of the main reasons for that is the um, uh, this suburban migration uh, phenomenon uh, for home buyers is real, but it's also uh, applicable to renters. You know, people uh, who are renting in an urban environment and, and decided to rent as a lifestyle choice uh, are continuing to rent as they migrate to the suburbs. <clears throat> and one of the things we're, we're finding is that uh, there are a lot of people uh, who've made a deliberate lifestyle choice to rent instead of buy. You know, now, it, 
for most of us as an economic decision uh, in a place like Memphis, it's, you know, it's cheaper to buy than rent. But some people say, you know, I get that, but uh, I've got un some uncertainty in my uh, family situation or some uncertainty in my job situation. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Uh, so I would rather uh, retain flexibility. Uh, and some people just don't like the responsibility of home ownership. You know, if something, you know, if, they're, if they kind of live their lives paycheck to paycheck, you know, if something goes wrong with the house, they want the landlord to, to be taking care of it so that they don't have to take care of it. But there's a price that they're, they're paying for, uh, for doing that. But for some people, that's just, just the way they want to, uh, want to run things. Uh, in other cases, <clears throat> people have no choice but to rent. Uh, you know that you know maybe their credit got damaged during the recession or during COVID, <clears throat> and consequently they uh, uh, really only have one choice, and, and that is uh, that's to rent. But that's largely what's uh, what's driving it. Yeah, I would even add these simply the aesthetics of living in a new home is becoming more attractive, especially as the renter pool starts to increase. And I think some of that stigma is wearing off of around what it means to be a renter. I mean, as we were talking about, leases have you know gone up 500 percent. And a lot of that is are toward the newer construction properties, simply because it's not very often that, uh, you know, renters will have the opportunity to live in a new construction home. So there, there are a myriad of factors that are ultimately driving it. Um, but fundamentally, it's we have an underbuilt world, uh, you know, world of new construction here in a single family, and there's a lot more people that are itching to live in those particular homes. Yeah. All right, uh, Jordan, was there a third one in there? Yes. So Natalie LaChapelle asked, I would like to be sure property management ex inspections are done minimally annually. I realize it takes time and wouldn't even mind paying a small fee for it. It can, it definitely can save in the end if issues are addressed as needed. Yeah, so let me let me address that, and, and let me just kind of lay out our formula for inspections. Um, there is one inspection, by the way, that it is an extra charge, and that's called the MEPAD. It's your mechanical, <laughs> plumbing, electrical, um, all of your technical products um, systems in the house, and, and that is an extra charge because uh, that's optional. But overall, on the house, we do a move-in inspection and we do a exit inspection, um, and in between. Once someone moves in, uh, in three months, we go out and do a three month inspection. And what we have found is what that property looks like at three months is a good, very good indicator of how that property is going to be treated going forward. So if at three months, it's, it gets an A grade, we give it an A, B, C grade. If it gets an A grade, we don't come back for nine more months. If it gets a B grade, it, we come back in six months. And if it's gotten a C grade, we're back in three months with a fix it list. Uh, so all these inspections come with, you need to do better at these particular things. And each property is not treated the same. It's based on that. It's based on each inspection and the grade they get, and then how far in the future we come back. So we're, we're giving the properties that need the attention, more attention, and the properties that don't, less attention. But that means your property is being seen uh, two to three times a year on average. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a visual inspection, uh, looking for clues of any lack of uh, care and maintenance on the house. And then again, we do have the MEPAD inspection, which is all of the uh, mechanical systems in the house, and we do charge extra for that. Nice. Um, Jordan, are there any other questions? Burdette Streeter was just asking if there's any cost for the PPR report, which there, I know the answer is no. There, there is no cost for that one. All right, well, that being said, uh, we just want to thank everyone for being here again today. Um, please know that we are going to get this recording on our website probably within the next two weeks would be my guess. So obviously, you're welcome to revisit and view it. If you have any more questions or want to speak to or get in contact with any of us on the panel, please feel free to jot down our contact information and reach out. Um, yeah, Brian, before, before we break, uh, I, the, the thought I had, uh, Came, came thundering back. Uh, a lot of people have been concerned about, uh, about uh, cash flow in light of the you know, cap rate compression. But uh, for those who are leveraging, 
you know, you're getting very good interest rates. And so that really helps the cash flow. And the other thing that's important to remember is uh, w once you've acquired a property, even if it doesn't cash flow great, you know, right after you, at, right after you buy it because of the, the cap, cap rate compression issue, remember that rents are going up uh, very, very rapidly. Uh, uh, and consequently, the, you know, you know, less desirable cash flow that you have the first year that you own the property is probably going to be better in years two and three as, as, as rents go up because rents, rents are going up uh, at, at a pace uh, much higher than inflation. And, and if you have uh, either no mortgage or you got a fixed rate mortgage, your, your uh, uh, expenses are not rising nearly as fast as the rents. And so the cash flow actually improves very, uh, very rapidly, uh, more, so, more, more so than normal. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, those are, those are great points. So um, that being said, I just wanna thank you all panelists for being here, attendees, thank you so much for being here and we will look forward to talking to you all next time.